Bem-vindos à sessão da tarde. Nós vamos agora eh, dedicar-nos a apreciar as novas tendências do direito da insolvência eh, e o impacto no, no judiciário. Eh, e para isso temos um painel eh, com quatro especialistas representantes dos quatro países que fazem parte do nosso projeto e que nos vão eh, tentar trazer aqui eh, algumas, algumas ideias para também debatermos relativamente a estes problemas gerados não só pelas novas tendências do direito europeu, mas também pelas alterações que têm sido feitas e que também já vimos na parte da manhã, que têm sido feitas nas leis nacionais e o impacto que isso pode trazer na, na eficiência e na eficácia dos, dos processos. Um, vamos começar sem mais delongas a apresentar a nossa primeira oradora, a juíza Fátima Reis Silva, que neste momento é adjunta do Gabinete da Ministra da Justiça, mas que antes disso tinha uma longa e larga experiência em alguns Tribunal de Comércio em Lisboa, e portanto é uma das maiores especialistas, digamos assim, para nos falar precisamente sobre as questões judiciais da insolvência em Portugal, e a doutora Fátima também é oradora em várias conferências e também tem bastante obra publicada relativamente a estas matérias da insolvência, e vamos, portanto, falar sobre a questão portuguesa. Obrigada, Sra. Professora. Quero começar por agradecer este convite para participar nesta avaliação do projeto em si e, muito concretamente, para estar presente e intervir nesta sessão, em especial em companhia de Indústria. Saúdo os meus colegas de painel e tenho de dizer que é um absoluto privilégio estar nesta, nesta companhia. Deixo uma palavra especial à doutora Catarina Ferrado, que conheço rigorosamente desde que se iniciou a discussão pública do Código de Insolvência das Empresas, salvo erro ali em maio, junho de 2004, exatamente. E foram muitas as conversas que tivemos sobre estes assuntos ao longo dos anos e em todas as semanas aproveitadas. Neste painel, o que, o, que, o, que, enfim, o que pensei fazer foi olhar ao futuro, mas no quadro dos nossos próprios sistemas de justiça. Eu tenho por hábito refletir sempre um pouco sobre o passado, quando analiso o presente e tento deslumbrar o futuro. Não se preocupa, não vou traçar uma evolução do direito parlamentar desde a quebra dos comerciantes até aos dias de hoje. Vou só recuar uh, à data da minha chegada à jurisdição de comércio, nos idos de 2001 e ao Código de Processos Especiais de Reparação de Empresas e de Falência, a nossa, uh, uh, um, perdão, a nossa legislação falimentar que vigorava na altura, na versão de 1993. Nesse tempo, a legislação era favorável à recuperação e esta era objetivamente mais fácil, generalizando, porque a inércia dos criadores jogava a favor do tutor um dos criadores mais inertes ao tempo, que é o Estado, uh, que sem quase exceção nunca tomava posição, contribuindo muito para essa inércia. E com uma máquina de cobranças do Estado, também não era tão eficiente nessa altura como verdadeiramente o é agora, uh, frequentemente os criadores públicos eram os maiores criadores e os mais inertes. O panorama começou a mudar com o governo estudiado por Drão Barroso, a partir de 2002, tendo num voto face claramente para muitos inesperado, e eu testemunhei isso no tribunal, uh, além do fortalecimento da cobrança, o Estado literalmente, um dia para o outro, começou a tomar posição nos processos de recuperação de empresa e sempre a mesma, contra. Sempre. Sem exceção. O não pagamento de impostos até aí era visto como um instrumento de Estado. E esta dupla mudança, maior eficiência e maior robustez na cobrança, e a sistemática oposição a qualquer tipo de recuperação apanharam literalmente muitas empresas desprendidas e deram, assim, a primeira grande crise de entradas de processual, pelo menos no Tribunal de Comércio de Lisboa, nessa altura, portanto, muito antes da crise e num panorama totalmente favorável, nós tivemos a nossa primeira grande colônia de falências motivada por estas questões mais públicas. Na conjuntura económica e financeira subsequente, foi quase natural que o Código de Insolvência de 2004, inspirado nos direitos alemão e espanhol, fosse um código completamente virado para a liquidação, em que o único instrumento de recuperação era o plano de insolvência e o processo de insolvência, extremamente difícil, pleno de complexidade processual e em que a inércia dos criadores jogava contra a recuperação dos criadores. Também este código, como os seus antecessores, todos, desde que conheço, desde que estudo isto, protestava ser um dos seus objetivos que as empresas chegassem mais cedo à falência, à insolvência, para se liquidar e recuperar. Também este código não conseguiu atingir esse desiderado. Também, ainda antes da crise, houve um outro fenómeno que dificultou ainda mais a vida dos devedores em dificuldades. 
o universo dos criadores pulverizou-se, também muito por força da, 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 da eficiência da máquina de curar dos Estados, uh, e passando a dever-se menos a mais, tornando muito mais difícil a reunião de consenso e de maiorias. Não tínhamos dois criadores que representavam 90% dos criadores, era mais fácil chegar a esses criadores. Quando temos milhares de criadores, é mais difícil chegar a um consenso. A crise, a crise sobre feito, como todos sabemos, atingindo a cheia do nosso tecido empresarial e causou, entre 2009 e 2011, uma verdadeira enchente de processo de insolvência, nem consigo chamar outro nome, se não disse, num universo em que predominavam as apresentações, nas insolvências requeridas por criadores, rareavam as oposições e em que as poucas tentativas de recuperação esbarravam incansavelmente os obstáculos que o Código de dizer. Em 2012 é aprovado e entra em vigor o processo especial de revitalização, o PES, subindo drasticamente o número de recuperações tentadas e conseguidas, uma taxa de aprovação rondante por 50%, sistematicamente. Quero, porém, chamar a atenção para o seguinte. Pese embora o inegável sucesso do PER, a grande maioria dos processos alimentares continuaram a ser em liquidação e continuou a ser o de 2012 para cá. 80 a 90% dos processos desta natureza que têm nos tribunais são, e não se prevê, que não deixem de ser nos próximos tempos com liquidação. Um dos efeitos imediatos desta legislação foi a canibalização dos planos de insolvência para recuperação. Deixaram de tudo simplesmente se fazer, porque era muito mais simples e muito mais rápido ir ao PER e o resto da é história recente. O PER salvou alguns milhares de empresas e de agregados familiares em Portugal e passado o pior da crise e constatados alguns abusos, e aqui devo dizer que eu nunca partilhei de uma certa visão de que tudo era abuso, não, sempre entendi que a legislação era permissiva propositadamente, e se era permissiva propositadamente, quem ela recorria não, poderia, não se podia considerar que estava a abusar. Mas dizia eu, perdão, constatados alguns abusos, foi revisto. Separaram-se as águas entre empresários e não empresários, fechou-se a possibilidade de ir até a empresas insolventes. A lei dizia que não era possível, mas na verdade, na prática, permitia, não dando mecanismos de controle, e eu continuo a achar que foi propositado. Na altura, era o que era necessário para salvar o Congresso da Salva. E esta, a fechada, o fecho do, 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 do recurso a pé a empresas já insolventes, que, do que, eu, do que me dizem os meus colegas dos tribunais e do que dizia a estatística, pouco, é uma das medidas mais efetivas tomadas nos últimos tempos para tornar a chegada ao processo de insolvência mais combustível. Por simples motivo que, se já estamos insolventes ou não, já estamos insolventes e não se pode recorrer a pé, não há outro remédio senão ir para isso. A forma como eu olho é para esta evolução mistura uh, fatores jurídicos e culturais. Nestes 17 ou 18 anos, muita coisa mudou e paradigmas autênticos. No SPREF, a declaração de falência de um particular equivalia a um perdão por dívidas. Verdadeiro, puro e duro. Mas ninguém recorria a ele porque o anátoma de ser declarado falido é demasiado uh, pesado e era profundamente rejeitado. Hoje em dia, a insolvência e a sua conjugação com a exoração do passivo restante são olhados com normalidade, sem qualquer rastro de humilhação e horror da antiga falência. Antes da criação dos tribunais de comércio, mesmo com a história que têm, não passava pela cabeça de nenhum advogado usar o processo de falência como instrumento de cobrança do crédito. E, após a criação dos tribunais, hoje em dia, isso é quase a primeira coisa que vai à cabeça. Este é outro paradigma que uh, mudou. Hoje em dia, a insolvência é uma normalidade. Não é uma fatalidade, é um instrumento, é um processo como os outros. E assim permaneceu, mesmo quando os tribunais de comércio definhavam sobre pendências e entradas desmesuradas e entradas exponenciais. O que não deixa de não ser absolutamente notável, porque foi exatamente isso que sucedeu, continuou-se encarado da mesma forma. Voltando à história recente, o PER foi um caminho novo trilhado com sucesso e agora que uma empresa insolvente não pode ele recorrer, terminará fatalmente, mais cedo ou mais tarde, no processo de insolvência. Os devedores e criadores que olham hoje o processo de insolvência com outros olhos e ferramentas como o early warning vão ajudar os menos preparados. O cenário atual em que as empresas chegam tarde e desmanteladas ao processo de liquidação causa um dois dos grandes problemas com que nos debatemos. A baixa taxa de recuperação de créditos e a longevidade do próprio processo. Se as empresas chegarem mais cedo à recuperação, melhor recuperam. Se as empresas chegarem mais cedo à liquidação, mais valor se retoma para a economia. Não acho que vamos aumentar muito o número de recuperações em relação ao panorama anterior, que devido ao pé já é considerável. Acho que vamos continuar a ter uma maioria de processos de liquidação, o que nos levanta dificuldades acrescidas no que aí vai. Porque os ventos que sopram 
com ou sem aderência à realidade são outros. Uh, aliás, devo dizer, por exemplo, durante, desde 2012 até hoje, quem abria a nossa página de divulgação de jurisprudência havia PER discutido, da primeira quase até à última linha. A jurisprudência de PER tive discussões interessantíssimas e evoluções interessantíssimas, mas na verdade 90% deste tipo de processos continuaram a ser liquidações, enquanto a jurisprudência e a doutrina se animavam à volta do PER. É um vento que sopra, é um bom vento, e os ventos que sopram agora são todos a favor da recuperação. Mas eu não tenho grandes dúvidas, posso estar enganada, Deus cara que estás enganada, mas eu acho que vamos continuar a ter uma esmagadora maioria de liquidações. O papel dos órgãos de insolvência é absolutamente crucial no desenvolvimento e sucesso do sistema nos próximos anos. Todas as alterações legislativas têm tipo de protagonistas os próprios devedores. O governo da apresentação, a responsabilidade, a possibilidade de recorrer ou não a um processo especial de capitalização. Mas temos que pensar também nos grandes protagonistas e destinatários do regime insolvencial, que são os criadores. A inércia dos criadores acaba por ser dificilmente explicável, pelo menos para mim, e tem que ser combatida no bom sentido, como é evidente. Os criadores têm que compreender que precisam de se juntar, precisam de agir em vez de reagir, têm que pesar os prós e contras da respectiva inatividade. A má fama do pé, por exemplo, <risos> A pregoada dos grandes criadores era absolutamente evitável se os criadores se tivessem juntado, usando um mecanismo legal que existe desde o início do PER, de ter antecipado das negociações, pudessem ter aos PERs abusivos. É mais fácil de nada fazer do que queixar-se que é mal usado, mas foi literalmente isto que aconteceu durante todos estes anos. Depois, os administradores judiciais, que são absolutamente essenciais, sendo que no panorama nacional há várias circunstâncias de terem. Temos uma classe genericamente envelhecida, que exerce estas funções ao similares há muito, sem fiscalização e sem controle efetivo. Exceção feita ao concurso de admissão de cerca de 70 novos profissionais em 2013, é uma classe profissional que está neste momento confrontada com um dilema. Precisam de renovação, mas num cenário em que a curva descendente, uma curva descendente, de processo a repartir, porque Graças a Deus, isto não, não está, também não é um vento que sopra, mas eu ainda uso e peço desculpa. Graças a Deus, de facto, a curva descendente agora é absolutamente notória. Uh, necessitam de formação e de fiscalização. Têm direito à formação e à fiscalização, que assegure um certo nivelamento. Sobre eles dependem obrigações e, na verdade, nem a formação nem a fiscalização têm sido verdadeiramente exercidas. E isto tem que ser dito com toda a clareza, é um cenário que claramente tem que ser, tem que ser alterado. Mais uma vez, como os criadores, não se pode só dizer que o que está mal, tem que se fazer alguma coisa por isso. E, de facto, a formação, a formação e a fiscalização dos administradores é, tem, tem que começar a seguir a vida. Porque nesta matéria reconhece se o juiz do processo não controla muito mais do que a atividade processual do administrador. Nem tem qualquer hipótese de o fazer. E quem deveria controlar substantivamente a conduta, no sistema do podem, as coisas funcionam bem. Os juízes controlam o processo, os criadores controlam o resto, controlam o mundo, controlam o material, controlam os preços, controlam as vendas, controlam etc. Mas não o fazem. A inércia dos criadores. Nem no seu próprio interesse. Ou só o fazem em processos de grandes interesses. De grande interesse para ele e de grandes interesses. É esse o cenário com que nos deparamos. E esta é, como eu digo, uma função que tem que ser dinamizada para não dizer criada. Formação e fiscalização dos uh, administradores. A conduta dos administradores contribui para outra sensação, que essa sim eu acho que é mais verdadeira, que é de opacidade que o processo de insolvência transmite. Um processo de insolvência parece um véu no qual ninguém consegue penetrar, às vezes nem nos juízes, não vamos mentir. Uh, porque, na verdade, nem tudo o que se passa está no processo. Depois, o facto de serem tramitados em tribunais assoberbados, se dividirem materialmente quer eletronicamente, quer em termos físicos, tem múltiplos apenas, o que é absolutamente essencial para a tramitação, mas não ajuda, não ajuda. Porque quem está habituado a consultar um processo, abre um processo e vê o que se passa. Aqui é preciso ver todos os apenas para perceber exatamente em que ponto uh, é que estamos. Tudo isto contribui para esta ideia de opacidade. Tudo isto contribui, por exemplo, para que, numa altura em que até já podemos consultar o processo eletronicamente, as pessoas continuem a dirigir ao balcão do tribunal. Porque é impossível antes. Neste momento, com os instrumentos que temos, que eu acho que até já são bastante avançados, 
Os instrumentos que são bons para a consulta do processo executivo não servem para a consulta do processo de insolvência. Um particular que está em casa e quer consultar um processo de insolvência vai desistir ao, ao terceiro penso. E vai ficar sem perceber exatamente o que se passou, porque ainda nem o nome dele conseguiu encontrar. Neste ponto, eu acho que o que temos é que apostar nos desenvolvimentos tecnológicos. Por exemplo, a consagração do leilão eletrónico como meio preferencial de liquidação ou a criação de uma interface de tramitação eletrónica para o administrador são exemplos e práticas que já estão na lei e que estão a ser, a, devem ser desenvolvidos até ao limite. O que também considero é que é pela via da inovação tecnológica e não só que vamos assegurar a transparência deste e de todos os outros, diga-se passagem de processos, Simplificação de linguagem, generalização da consulta eletrónica, digitalização integral, automação de operações materiais, etc, etc. E é seguramente por essa via. E por último, e não menos importante, o papel dos juízes. Penso que é inegável o papel essencial da especialização nesta matéria. E em reconhecimento e desenvolvimento do princípio da especialização, em 2014, a jurisdição do comércio foi profundamente estendida e agora, agora cobra mais de 60% do país. Peço desculpa, não fui ver exatamente quanto é que era, mas sei que é mais de 60%. Perdoe-me agora a indesta, sou e serei uma juíza de comércio. Apesar que agora ser juíza de desembarcadora, na verdade eu sou uma juíza de comércio. Mas a especialização trouxe uma profunda alteração positiva na forma como estes processos são encarados, tramitados e decididos. A especialização tem profundos ônus para os magistrados em concreto. Têm que saber cada vez mais sobre os assuntos a que se dedicam, sem deixar de abarcar as mais áreas necessárias, nomeadamente o direito processual, o direito constitucional, tem que equilibrar a qualidade do que produzem com a qualidade necessária e tem que ser o bastião último dos direitos de todos os intervenientes. O futuro traz-nos muitos desafios, mas em especial um desafio novo que me preocupa. Como sabemos, está em avançado estado de discussão a proposta de diretiva 2016-359, que a Comissão apresentou em novembro de 2016, quanto aos quadros jurídicos a matéria de reestruturação preventiva, concessão de uma segunda oportunidade e aumento, aumento e eficiência dos processos de reestruturação, insolvência e equitação. A discussão já sofreu importantes impressões sobre a presidência húngara do Conselho e agora já em outubro, este outubro, sobre a presidência austríaca, mas como se adivinhava desde a sua apresentação, há linhas de força que não vão ser eliminadas nem alteradas. E esta minha referência não é nenhuma crítica, nem um elogio, é uma constatação de facto. Nós temos já desde 2012 um processo preventivo de estruturação, que já aperfeiçoámos em 2017, e agora provavelmente tenha que vir a ser reponderado uh, quando a diretiva seja adotada, se que agora já temos a possibilidade de adaptar este ou fazer ao lado, já é uma evolução uh, que tivemos. Uma das questões que me preocupa é o papel do juiz no controle do médico dos planos. Pese embora várias propostas de alteração nesta matéria, que levem uma maior flexibilidade quanto à intervenção dos juízes, o número 3 do artigo 10 da proposta não sofreu nenhuma alteração desde o início e diz ali que os, se deve assegurar que as autoridades judiciais ou administrativas possam recusar-se a confirmar um plano de reestruturação, caso este não apresente perspectivas razoáveis de evitar a insolvência do futuro ou de garantir a viabilidade da empresa. O considerante 30B, que é agora desta redação de, de outubro, uh, contém expressa referência que não vai ser exigido aos Estados que esta apreciação seja feita oficiosamente. Mas ainda assim, esta apreciação está aqui e tem que ser feita. Esta é uma nova função que me preocupa e que considero que é um desafio estruturante para os juízes e sistemas nacionais, mas em especial um desafio judicial importante. Este juízo de mérito é direto sobre o mérito do plano enquanto instrumento de recuperação. Se o plano tem a capacidade de evitar a insolvência e se garante a viabilidade, de, viabilidade da empresa. É um controle técnico e um controle económico. No jeito português, este juízo, desde que me conheço, lembra-se, estamos quase de 2001 para cá, não, não, desde que me conheço, sempre foi cometido aos criadores. Desde que há instrumentos legais de recuperação, ao juízo nunca coube este específico controle. Muitos outros sempre couberam. Este nunca. Sempre coube aos criadores. No fim do dia, perdão. No nosso direito atual, a lei comete ao juiz uma grande franja de recusa oficiosa, da obligação, é o nosso artigo 215 do CID, mas que não passa por este tipo de juízo técnico, exceto quando atinja a inexequibilidade por enotar. Quando o plano seja claramente inexequível, dificilmente terá sido votado favoravelmente, mas se o for, é um daqueles casos em que o juiz controla o mérito, mas tem que ser absolutamente notório. Mesmo que os juízes sejam devidamente assessorados nesta tarefa, e a proposta diretiva também o refere, no fim do dia, é sempre uma decisão dos juízes por mais assessores e mais ajuda técnica que tenha. É o mesmo juiz que, no direito societário, está limitado pela business judgment rule. 
por não ser considerada a pessoa mais bem colocada para avaliar decisões passadas de gestão. E agora recebe o encargo de avaliar rigorosamente o futuro. É claramente uma nova decisão, é claramente um grande desafio, que põe sobre outro foco a especialização e a educação dos juízes. Desafio para o qual espero que estaremos prontos quando isso vier a colocar. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigada, doutora Fátima. Uh, Present uh, our second speaker. Uh, I'm sorry for my English in advance. Um, and we, we would like to present uh, Judge Luciano Panzani, which comes from, who comes from Italy. I will uh, read because I don't want to forget anything. Um, so, um, Judge Panzani is a former president of the first instance court of Torino and former judge of the first chamber of the Supreme Court of Cassazione uh, and is now a president, the president of the Court of Appeal in Rome. Uh, he is presently a member of the new committee uh, appointed in February uh, 2015 uh, from the Italian Ministry of Justice to update the Italian uh, insolvency law. He uh, is a contributor of many law uh, Italian uh, journals uh, and author of many publications in insolvency and company law. He has also been a uh, professor uh, in uh, uh, Torino, Rome, Siena, uh, Nicaragua, uh, Russia, Romania and the, in the United States. Um, and he is uh, um, uh, he's also a speaker in uh, various meetings about uh, insolvency law. So I will leave you with the challenges of the new uh, insolvency law. Thank you. Thank you for this kind invitation. I am very happy to be here. And uh, I will uh, continue what uh, Nicolò Briani was uh, telling you about uh, the Italian uh, situation. We had uh, the main reform of the Italian insolvency law uh, as amendments uh, to the Act of 1942. It was quite old in the 2005-2006. And uh, I should say, now we are, uh, we are waiting the enacting of the new act, a uh, recast of all the insolvency uh, law, but I, I have to say that this reform will not change the main features of our uh, system. Uh, so, um, when I speak about uh, Italian insolvency law, I have to say that uh, um, Italy has all the tools that normally European countries or US have to deal with the crisis or insolvency. The times of uh, liquidation and nothing else are gone from a lot of uh, time. Uh, we have uh, different uh, restructuring proceedings different types of restructuring proceeding, but the restructuring plan is uh, presented by a debtor in possession, there is automatic stay, deep financing, super priority uh, for, for financing, for finance, uh, classes of creditor, absolute priority rule, crime down, so more or less all the concept we use uh, everywhere in, uh, in the world. And the recast uh, uh, comes from the need uh, of, uh, uh, of rewriting all the rules because part of these rules were coming from 1942. It was uh, a, a, an act uh, very good from the technical point of view, but uh, absolutely old. Then uh, there were the new rules inserted in 2005-2006 and uh, other acts that almost each year from 2006 until uh, now were in, uh, modifying something because the crisis was uh, going on and there was the need sometimes uh, from uh, uh, needs of the banks, see, uh, the banking system, sometimes from the government uh, and general uh, economic purposes, uh, sometimes uh, from, uh, uh, from lawyers uh, by association and so to change something. So uh, it was clear that it was the need to rewrite uh, all these uh, uh, rules. Uh, I will not speak about uh, 400 articles of law because it will, <laughs> it's quite impossible. Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, I would like uh, to start with Article 1. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but uh, um, I would like uh, uh, to say something about a few uh, issues. First, uh, the, uh, something new, the alert system. The alert system uh, comes from a long debate uh, interior to Italy, and uh, uh, the good occasion was the, uh, the recommendation of the European recommendation of 2014, and also the, uh, the proposal of a directive for the organization with the early warning uh, system. What is the alert system? Uh, it works in two ways. For the companies, in the Italian uh, company law, we have a controller inside of the, the company who have the, the job to advise the administrator and uh, if something is going wrong and uh, also uh, to, uh, to ask uh, to call a meeting of uh, shareholders if uh, the problems are becoming bigger and well these, uh, these people that normally are accountants uh, have the duty if there are the likelihood of crisis I should say I am translating freely the, the Italian uh, expression um, to um, inform first of all the administrator and ask them what they want to do but uh, if they do nothing there is uh, a public body created by the Chamber of Commerce three, uh, three experts, a panel of three experts appointed to do this uh, job and uh, uh, the, uh, the controller uh, informed this, uh, this body, the body called the administrator of the board and asked them what they want to do. And uh, if they do nothing, there can be uh, something more. So the administrator can be asked to come to the court. They have a space of time to open a insolvency proceeding. And uh, last, at the end of this, all these steps, there is the possibility that the public prosecutor uh, ask for the opening of a proceeding <coughs> if there is an insolvency. So, um, all these uh, tools are written not to work, not to be uh, used to, uh, to alert the administrator they have to do something before it's too late. The Italian situation is uh, similar to other countries. We have uh, the the vast majority of uh, Italian companies are family companies. The management uh, and uh, uh, the family are the same people. And so uh, we, they resist until the last moment to, uh, to do something or to uh, renounce to the control uh, to um, permit the entry of, uh, uh, of new equity, of, of new uh, associates and so on. And so this is a way to change something. There is a second uh, approach to the alert system coming from the um, public bodies, first of all the tax agency, who are normally creditors. In Italy we have uh, this uh, happens many times that uh, the, the debtor, when he is uh, stressed, is not able to pay all the creditors, decide not to pay taxes, not to pay uh, contribution for workers, because uh, the state uh, will come uh, asking for uh, his claim later. And so it's, uh, uh, it's more important to uh, pay um, suppliers or to pay banks. And uh, uh, so, uh, but in this way, uh, you have a very uh, not safe system of financing of the of financement of the enterprises. So also these uh, public bodies have the duty uh, when uh, you uh, are up on a certain threshold to um, inform the, uh, the, this public body, the, the Chamber of uh, Commerce. There has been a big debate on this uh, system. Uh, at the beginning, the um, association of uh, private enterprises, the so-called Confindustria, was against it. And uh, at the end, at a certain moment, uh, uh, I should say that the, the vast majority of uh, operators in the, in the economic, um, in the, in the financing, in the economic uh, sector, decided that uh, 
we needed it. And now we have to see how it will uh, work. Second, uh, um, second new, uh, something complete new, uh, is the, the creation of uh, uh, rules about the insolvent group. Italy was perhaps the first country in Europe to introduce a legislation on uh, insolvent groups, but only for the bigger enterprises in the uh, special proceeding, the so-called extraordinary administration. Extraordinary administration is ruled not by a court, but by the government. And is reserved to the biggest enterprises like uh, it was in the past, Parmalat or uh, Alitalia, when uh, you need uh, uh, a driver in the government. And uh, for this type of enterprises, we had, uh, since uh, 1979, a, a group uh, legislation. But uh, then Italy was not able to uh, extend these rules to the, group, uh, uh, to the company's group uh, who operate normally. In the, uh, and so uh, the, the court were tried to create uh, some jurisprudence uh, uh, to be able uh, to have uh, a, no, uh, uh, a one driving uh, court, uh, but it was quite difficult. Now we have a, a notion of group that is not the same of the uh, European regulation across border insolvency, but anyways it's very close to it because it's linked to the notion of control, um, controlled by the majority of um, uh, in, the, in the shareholders meeting, but also as control of fact. And, uh, uh, and then uh, you can have uh, not a substantive consolidation like in the US, but uh, a procedural consolidation. It means uh, that you, uh, there will be the competence on the only one court. Uh, normally, the, the court where is the seat of the holding. And uh, uh, then you have uh, the, the same administrator appointed in, the, uh, in all the companies of the group. You have a plan that is a plan, a true plan, not a plan. Uh, of uh, uh, one company or few companies. You can also have different proceedings. Uh, for instance, you can have a liquidation proceeding for one company and a restructuring proceeding for uh, different types of restructuring proceeding for uh, other companies. You have also the possibility to finance uh, the restructuring of one company with uh, uh, finance coming from another company of the group, provided that uh, is, uh, uh, say, where did uh, save the um, interest of all the creditors of the group, not only of one company. But uh, uh, it was uh, uh, quite a controversial uh, topic, uh, and uh, we had a decision of court against it uh, until now, so it's uh, quite an improvement. Then you have uh, clawback action uh, between uh, uh, the more uh, severe rules about uh, clawback action between uh, the, uh, the companies of, uh, of the group. And uh, uh, you have also, uh, in certain way, different, not, uh, not completely different from the uh, normal civil company law, but uh, um, rule modified to be applied in the insolvency system referring to the responsibility, the liability of the administrator when uh, related to the wrongdoing when the, uh, the holding um, takes uh, the, in, in bad way the, the control of uh, the subsidiary, creating damages to the creditors of the subsidiary or to the value of the um, participation in the uh, subsidiary. So uh, I am not able at, at, in this moment to resume all this uh, um, different features of this discipline that's quite uh, uh, big. You have, uh, uh, it seems to me, 20 or 25 uh, articles of law, but uh, uh, it's the first uh, attempt to have a complete organization of these rules. My, my sense is that it's not uh, so far 
from the rules uh, of, uh, that other countries uh, introduce uh, in, their, uh, in their system. And there uh, is absolutely a necessity to, to have such rules uh, for the normal uh, enterprises. Last uh, topic I want uh, um, to speak about is uh, the, mm, the situation uh, of the shareholders uh, in the Italian uh, insolvency law. Uh, I know that uh, in the past, not in Italy, but in some cases, uh, uh, there was a position of uh, shareholders uh, to the um, restructuring plan of a uh, group of uh, a company because it was against their own uh, interest. Italian law was always oriented to protect creditors and not to protect shareholders. The uh, shareholders are seen like, <coughs> I should say, a postponed creditors. <coughs> they have a claim referred to the capital, to the investment they did, and so they are not able to uh, speak against uh, the restructuring uh, plan when uh, the, the, the enterprise is insolvent. But many times it is not so easy to understand that if uh, the enterprise is insolvent or is, uh, there is a crisis and uh, if it, uh, this situation of crisis can create uh, um, damages to shareholders that still have something, um, part of their uh, right is still alive. And, uh, um, well, I should say that Italian uh, law decided to do a choice to protect creditors, and so uh, we have a different, uh, two different notions. Crisis, uh, crisis is, uh, as I told you before, is uh, a likelihood of insolvency, not insolvency. And, or, and then you have insolvency, uh, uh, the typical notion of insolvency. But uh, crisis uh, is uh, treated as uh, mm, upcoming insolvency, and so there is no protection. Uh, for shareholders, except when the company law uh, gives them some uh, tools uh, to uh, act against uh, some decision. But the reform did something very uh, strong, in the sense that uh, when you have a merge, or uh, you have a division of uh, companies, and this merge and this division of companies is uh, part uh, of uh, a restructuring plan, uh, before the reform, you had the, the shareholders had the possibility to challenge uh, this decision, looking uh, at the tools provided by the company law, and the uh, uh, creditor had the possibility to challenge uh, the plan uh, to the calm down and the, 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 the insolvency discipline we uh, we all know. Well, now the shareholders have to use the same tools as uh, the creditor. So it means that shareholders may challenge the decision of the merger or the decision of the division only when, as creditor, they can receive damage, not as a shareholders. And uh, um, then we have uh, another very sensitive uh, point. Uh, uh, since uh, 2006, the application for the opening of the restructuring proceeding in joint stock company and limited liability company is approved by the administrator. And the law doesn't provide means for the shareholder to contest this decision other than the general provision set forth in the law to challenge the board of the director's decision that are quite difficult <coughs> to apply. Because when the board decides to uh, go to the court and ask for the opening of uh, an insolvency proceeding, a restructuring proceeding, uh, the decision of uh, the minority shareholders to challenge the decision of the board uh, with the ordinary tools provided by the company law is, uh, comes too late because uh, already you have uh, uh, the pending procedure or the restructuring plan uh, approved by, uh, by the court. It happens very, uh, very quickly. And uh, uh, by the way, in the court of the jurisprudence is the sense that this is not uh, a decision, uh, but more a an information to the court that the situation that is uh, pending. 
So uh, shareholders are not uh, protected in, uh, in this situation. Uh, mm, also, when uh, you have uh, um, the possibility for creditors, uh, provided already by the law, to present a different plan or, uh, at the opening of the restructuring proceeding, and uh, um, creditors are called to vote two different plans, uh, when the plan is approved by the court, the court may uh, apply the commissioner to, uh, to do the next steps to implement the plan and also to, uh, to change the, the composition of the capital of the company without uh, the right of option for uh, shareholders. And also in this case, uh, shareholders don't have special protection. They have the protection provided by the company law, but is quite inefficient uh, against the uh, restructuring plan and situation of this time. So um, the, um, I understand uh, on, 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 on a theoretical point of view, uh, it could be a, a fall uh, of protection of shareholders, but I think that, as a matter of fact, it's very difficult to imagine a situation where really shareholders are not uh, protected, because uh, um, it's very, almost, uh, I don't remember uh, any case where uh, creditors uh, uh, could be paid uh, fully, and so the protection of shareholders come after this, uh, this uh, the creditors protection and uh, to uh, give them uh, something more than the, what is provided by the Italian law could mean to undermine the efficiency of the restructuring uh, uh, procedures. Thank you. Next up is uh, our uh, specialist from Poland. I'm sorry because I'm going to say your name for it. Uh, but it's Mr. Bartosz Bro or something like that. Sorry. <laughs> it will be written. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, Mr. Bro is an attorney at law in Krakow and a former president of the, uh, former vice president, sorry, of the uh, Allerand Institute, which is a partner with our Polish uh, colleagues. Um, he was also an advisor of the Ministries of Justice and Economy in Poland. And uh, it was, he was involved in the amendments, uh, the recent amendment of the Polish law. Uh, he also represents the Poland as a consultant uh, in the World Bank, uh, in the ANSIC role, and uh, in the European Bank uh, for Reconstruction and Development. And he's a published author uh, in this field of insolvency. And he will talk to us about restructuring, restructuring procedures and insolvency, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, for the presentation. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank all the organizers and the partners for a kind invitation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my English suppose has been start for um, disclaimers. Uh, sorry for my English and sorry for, for uh, skipping some uh, firstly for the two some slides, but like. Uh, Professor uh, was following the previous speech of his colleague. Uh, for me, it was also a pleasure to follow previous speech of the most distinguished ladies, which was given in the first panel regarding Polish change of law. Uh, and I will try to, to speak about three uh, issues. I will try to add maybe some short comments to uh, these issues given earlier about the change of law, this, this big one which uh, happened in Poland. Uh, I will try to, like Professor, in, present you, in my opinion, some uh, changes that, that are well taken in practice uh, after the amendments, amendments um, were given. And I would like to stop on the uh, last slide, which is, in my opinion, the, the, the most uh, important one in which refers to directions of the uh, law uh, in Europe, but I have the scope and the vision of uh, possible directions of uh, the changes of law in Poland. So, uh, like it was said, the, 
the sources of law uh, in Poland are uh, quite uh, old, uh, but the general uh, change happened uh, in 2015 with effect on uh, 2016. And what, what I want to add, what already been said, the reasons for the changes, uh, changes uh, are like Paul said in, in his um, previous uh, speech, the time and money, yes, the, 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 the main, main uh, issues and main um, tools which uh, shall be taken into account to have effective law. So in Poland, I think the reasons were quite similar like, uh, in other countries, but we have, we had one, I think, quite um, significant difference and it was uh, pointed, uh, it, it was placed in the definition of uh, insolvency. We had quite harsh definition in general before the amendment. The definition was that if the entity didn't pay two uh, debts, yeah, two, two uh, claims, he is insolvent. Uh, and he had to rea react in 14 days. So it's quite um, harsh, like I said, and it completely abstracts from the possibility to pay the debt, yes, which is quite, I think, uh, uncommon. So that was the, the, the main reasons, if I can say so. Um, we also, I think, with the amendment shift uh, through winds of change, which also have been uh, said, to lower the formalism in, in uh, the proceedings and to fasten the proceedings, which is, I think, also quite a general um, problem of, of many um, rulings. Uh, I will uh, tell about the examples about, about, uh, of, of the new uh, law in this like uh, the general aim of the amendment was not only to um, uh, have less formalized uh, proceedings but also to shift the balance on the restructuring because of the harsh definition of insolvency and the effects of the previous law system the restructuring in <coughs> Poland simply uh, was not working so the um, uh, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Economy, like it was said, decided to provide four new um, restructuring proceedings, one out of the court restructuring proceeding, with, which all, all already was said, uh, one accelerated proceeding, which uh, is one of the most common in practice right now proceeding, what is quite important. Uh, the arrangement proceedings, which, which wasn't changed and they stayed like it, they were um, earlier and proceeding on the um, border of, of the insolvency and uh, the restructuring or bankruptcy, remedial proceedings with quite significant uh, tools and institution uh, given to the insolvency practitioner which uh, the, takes action in this proceeding. I will skip about uh, those slides um, which shows the, the, the idea of the proceedings uh, in order to focus late, later on on direction of the changes but you, can, uh, you will be provided with this, uh, with this uh, presentation so you can read it lately. Like I said, the remedial proceeding is the most significant one and uh, right now we are asking ourselves uh, does it work uh, properly because even if the like it also was said by Paul even if the proceedings in the court has ended we don't see the economic effects of this proceeding so right now we'll simply see does that uh, law in books covers with the law in action uh, really uh, moving to second part those examples of institutions which in, in, in the aim uh, of the, uh, the action team, if I can say so, 
uh, we're about to improve uh, the law. First, the example was also already given is the central register, yes, which is uh, like you know unicorn or, or yeti. We know that it should be, but nobody sees it till now. So, but we keep our finger crossed uh, that this tool will be provided because, like you see on this slide, is has, it has quite significant significant um, fields to cover. It will be not only a published board, but it will also um, provide the information between the participants of the proceeding. It will also be a tool to communicate, which is also a problem given by on the earlier uh, speeches between the participants of the uh, proceeding without the, this uh, whole uh, problem with being un, um, independent. Yes, by the judge. Uh, so it, it even will provide some um, drafts uh, for creditors, for participants, and even for the court of, of, of uh, their rulings. So I think it's, it, it will be quite significant to in all kind of the proceedings, not only bankruptcy proceedings, but especially restructuring proceedings. We will still be waiting on it. Uh, there are also some significant changes with the creditors uh, committee that maybe this, the, the, the scope of uh, tools of the creditors committee wasn't really uh, larger but uh, it gains quite significant the most significant um, uh, right to change or to point the uh, insolvency practitioner to the court in this way that the court cannot uh, challenge th this point, uh, this, this, this uh, selection. So we know in practice it might be the most significant, and it is in practice the quite significant change, because which also was told uh, today, uh, many depends on the culture, the knowledge and the practice of the insolvency practitioner, because you know, it's, sorry it's quite obvious for us, but it's not obvious for the rest of the world. Uh, the, they are not perfect. Not always they are perfect. So, so it's, a, it's a significant change here. Uh, there also uh, have been some significant changes uh, regarding the creditors meeting in the restructuring proceedings uh, focused especially on the voting yeah, for the agreement. We eliminated uh, the passive creditors. Yes. So before the, the the amendment, if somebody it was called even voting by the legs, yes, didn't appear on the creditors meeting, he was taken into account as a vote for no. After the change of law, he is not taken into account, or no, or yes. So it's also incentive for the creditors to engage into proceeding. It is quite important in our uh, opinion because it also uh, have a educational role, which is, I don't know what I'm saying, but it's true. It, it is also has an education role uh, for the business creditors who not only are angry because of the moment which they are. Yes, they lost some of, uh, some money, uh, they money, but but uh, they knew that for uh, two, two, uh, two quite important things that it is under the supervision of the court this whole division of the uh, uh, assets district assets and the second they see that uh, they can really help this entity to survive the restructuring proceeding they see that many things also depends on their reaction. So uh, we decided to, to uh, have this change. There are three quite significant uh, streamlining of, of the um, holding of the, of the creditors meeting. I will don't uh, go, go into the details. You can get back to it uh, with my presentation, but uh, like I said, we tried to be quite modern, which was already said. We tried to not have uh, communication parallelly by different ways, formal way, yeah, 
internet and so on, we try to use and take advantage of all the um, uh, technical uh, achievements. So we, we already uh, made some provisions that allow us to use such tools in order to you know, facilitate, facilitate and, and, uh, the, the time of the proceeding. Uh, we, like you see, uh, some different uh, possibilities are already given by the law and the, there is a, uh, one provision which it, you know, gives a possibility to organize by the court the way of voting, which is, I think, quite significant and uh, wide uh, field to be covered. <coughs> what, is, what is also quite, uh, in my opinion and in my practice, what is also quite important tool and um, a law uh, institution, it is the well, partial agreement. Uh, we, we decided to provide this institution <coughs> with uh, the amendment. Uh, as the practice shows, it is often, very often, an um, option to choose by the big companies, not to engage, you know, all the small creditors who in practice in the restructuring procedures were also were often proposed 100% of, of uh, covering their debts. Uh, so there was no especially need, economical need to engage them in the proceeding. There was no need to you know, block their uh, payings and so on. So we tried for, we learned from the our neighbors and, and try to copy so this institution. And like I said, it's right now one of the most common institutions regarding big companies. And the last slide, which uh, I would like to stop on for a minute. In my opinion, looking for changes that have uh, already been done and looking about the changes that are um, discussing and, and done uh, on the different forums, there will be a need, I will go especially with Poland, but I'm a very uh, precious what, what, what Professor Wessels will uh, tell about it. The uh, directions will go on small and medium enterprises to deliver a path, unformalized, simple, not complicated in economical or legal way, simple path for small entities to or restructure, uh, restructuring or for bankruptcy, even especially for bankruptcy for such entities, like it was said, because of many of them simply will face poverty of the real estate, of the bankruptcy uh, estate and in Poland poverty of the bankruptcy estate. <coughs> Uh, means that the, the, the motion will be dismissed and the company will come back to the, you know, economical uh, game, yes, and, and the owners will have to close it by their own, yes, what in practice means that the owner will abandon this uh, company and nobody is happy, yes. It's, just, it's even worse than it been before the uh, actions taken. Uh, so this is the one significant path to be covered, uh, especially in Poland. What is about? Uh, what is uh, quite, uh, I think, interesting that uh, professor said that many even uh, lawyers um, uh, made mistakes in, in motions of bankruptcy. I'm not s s surprised because uh, you may not know that in Poland the most complicated legal motion is motion for declaring bankruptcy. But the only one motion may compete with it, consumer motion for the bankruptcy. <laughs> because it's in the form. Yes, which is uh, quite, quite uh, I think interesting. The, the, the second, in my opinion, if I can refer to the slide of, of, of uh, Professor Paul, uh, ideal model of restructuring, uh, it will um, be placed in pre-restructuring. There, in my opinion, is a great need to coherence between the provisions of the different branches of the law in order to uh, report economical effects of each entity in the 
more often way and, and in the fully way because it is uh, in Poland it is quite different for the different character of the of the entity which uh, results for the creditors acting in the game economical game um, uh, with lack of knowledge about the uh, economical um, uh, background of this company so it's in my opinion very very important uh, field to be covered. Uh, also, which already was told uh, because of the way of the conducting business is right now shifting to, to, to holdings, there is a need to at least provide, like Professor Kozani said, at least procedural cost coherence and procedural provisions for group of companies like you did. Uh, because uh, right now we are talking for three years uh, about the need to, for example, the simple thing, appoint the same IP uh, for the group of companies, that in practice it won't happen. So, you know, everybody, it may happen, but it rarely happens. In, at least in my practice, I, I have, I think, three or four uh, uh, group of companies uh, which I, I held as an uh, attorney at law uh, in restructuring. In none of them, I have the same uh, IP. So I'm glad that it happens some, somewhere else. And the last, which is already been done, but we are uh, before the, the uh, uh, legal project. Uh, there, there is a need to streamline prepare procedure. It's it's a very very uh, good procedure in practice in Poland, but it's right now not as transparent as we need to uh, be and develop uh, out of the court procedures. I think that the most uh, important directions that we need to be covered. Thank you very much. Well, last but not least, our um, last specialist from the Netherlands. Um, well, I can say specialist from the Netherlands, but maybe Professor Bob Wessels uh, is one of the most important uh, voices of insolvency in in Europe, so maybe uh, said as a specialist uh, in Europe. Uh, Professor uh, Bob Wessels was a teacher for 25 years in Leiden University and was a visiting professor uh, in uh, many universities around the world in Frankfurt, Riga, New York and Pretoria. Uh, and he's, he has an extended array of publications uh, about uh, international and mostly European insolvency law. Uh, he's also an independent counselor, counselor and advisor and uh, deputy justice in the Court of Appeal of the Hague. And we, he will present us uh, with uh, a communication about rescue in business uh, in insolvency law. Uh, dank u wel, dat was een hele prettige en aangename introductie. Ik wilde met u spreken over harmonisatie in de Europese insolventie. So I'm trying to address you in my second language. <laughs> Only a few people understand what you're puking about. Um, and I brought my driver to assist me with the slides. <laughs> And I learned from him that the most complicated motion is emotion. <laughs> no, um, we are avoiding what we did till some eight years ago, the H word. You know, in normal communication, you try to avoid the F word. But we avoid the H word. It was the European Parliament in 2011 that for the first time used the word harmonization <laughs> of insolvency laws in Europe. So it's only six or seven years ago. A theme that was not spoken about until then. So let me take you forward. So 20. 21, there will be a final directive. In 2019, like February, March, there will be um, the final directive that has to be implemented two years later. 
November 2016, we had a draft directive. In March 2014, there was a recommendation on a new approach to business failure. No member state seriously looked at that recommendation. If seven or eight would have done that, Paul Omer and I would have been out of job. Because <laughs> the European Commission never would have started to talk about a directive. It is the lack of activity in member states themselves. So don't blame Brussels. Some countries <laughs> like to do that. Blame yourself. <laughs> so the H word came out by the European Parliament in 2011. And I, um, together with some other colleagues, went to the European Law Institute that started, I think, seven or eight years ago from now. But at that time was looking for a project, either commercial, public law, criminal law. So I met one of the uh, professors in charge and said, what about bankruptcy law? Oh, okay, can you send in the proposal? Of course. What's in it for me? I'm Dutch, so we have to <laughs> deal with that in a, in a minute. Well, roughly about 200 or 250,000 euros. Yoma, Yoma. So we drafted this proposal for the rescue of business in insolvency law. Slide, please. No, <laughs> so the business we, we call it the business rescue pro project in insolvency law. With the aim, we started first quarter of 2014. Last September, we presented our report. Um, 400 pages. I start with page one now. So it's quite large. But the aim was to create a framework, a set of norms and requirements to enable further development of functional business rescue rules in, uh, in Europe. This is my younger brother, and the other co-reporter <laughs> is Professor Stefan Madaus. You know, he's the clever guy. <laughs> he is about 40, 40-ish. Uh, uh, he, he did his Habilitationsschrift, which is a large PhD in Germany, 800 pages. He had been in the uh, US uh, for a year and he wrote on the German ESUG, meaning the reorganization rules in Germany, compared to chapter 11. So he was really the, the, the brain uh, chart. And then the next slide, please. Uh, we presented our report in September <coughs> 2017. So you see what Vessel's blog. Where you see some stuff on it, you can go to the European Law Institute uh, site and download it for free. I think it is, and in the papers of SSRN, you see it also. And we just finalized the hard copy to go into a book of Oxford University Press. It was more than a thousand pages, uh, but it included not four but thirteen countries. Country reviews, we call them, or country reports. And they, those were selected by the European Law Institute itself, because it's a rather academic institute. So we have a process, process of approving and giving recommendations for changing a few project, which is a little bit different than the European uh, Commission works. Uh, we ended up with 13 countries, including, for instance, Greece, I remember Romania, I remember Lithuania, I remember Sweden as part of the Nordic uh, families and some of the rest of the European countries. We had a questionnaire poll, you've seen the questionnaire, was it 15 or 18 pages with 170 whatever questions. And there are still academics in the world that are able and eager to fill in all the questions. We like it very much because the only thing that you can do some qualitative uh, research. Um, well, if we take all this stuff together and uh, 
Fatima also talking about in the translation, the paradigm shifts, I heard. Roughly, I see some five paradigm shifts in all those countries. First of all, the goal or the aims of insolvency law have changed. Rather, exclusively to protect private interests, to be used as a machine for rehabilitation of the debtor and the continuity of the business, involving much more stakeholders, not only you know, the creditors, I want my money, creditors, no, creditors, but also uh, employees, much more than it used to be, also uh, shareholders, maybe also agencies that care for further development of uh, the environment, etc. Two, insolvency as a terminal proceeding for business ending in liquidation to the recognition of using law as a toolbox of instruments. It's the instrumentalization of insolvency law and so a beautiful example from Poland where the creditors are given functions and have holding meetings and streamline of how, how it has to do. So it's not only if you're a creditor or let me call a lawyer and he said, well, these are your rights. No, there are some streamlines. So you better, you can better involve yourself in, in uh, the project. Three, and Paul was talking about it also, from moral sin to, you know, insolvency is a calculated risk. It's a business risk. You made the, 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 the same point. Um, don't take it too harsh, you know. It's the same like appointing a director or a CEO. Oh, it, it is applying for results. So take out the most important motion in insolvency, emotion. <laughs> From a very formal proceeding, as I heard I, I've been a, a judge in a quote, Court of Appeal for over 25 years, all the stacked pile of paper that you get. Um, try to deformalize it, be more, um, more flexible. Sometimes also take your head out of the typical principles of insolvency law, pari passu, and uh, same rights for creditors, because we are talking about contractualization what used to be insolvency law. So we should go back to the principles of contract law instead of every time carrying the burden of the forecast shadow of insolvency law into our pre-insolvency process. And lastly, I think uh, you made the point also, uh, further professionalization, uh, professionalization, the growing emphasis on the integrity of the of the IPs and of the courts. So that's you know some tendencies that you see uh, all over it. And because the, the theme of this afternoon also is court, I thought if you cannot use your head, you use an overhead. You see it here. I will explain uh, what I see as the role of the courts. Thank you. Welcome. I will help you. I have to stand up. Thank you. So, what uh, is uh, the author there saying about the role of the court? So, this is a, a result of the European Law Institute study from September last. I put on the slide. We know that judges were supervising the liquidation process, appointing an IP. I think the project was very uh, clever to not dive into all the different systems of appointing an IP because you drown yourself uh, and it takes a year to get dry again. So appointing and supervising the IP, deciding on complaints and objects of the parties, typically traditional role of the court. The proceeding itself is rather similar organized as enforcement law proceedings. Francis, I want my money. And there's a central role for the judge. 
and although I'm, I'm, a, I'm a professor in all the stuff of functions, I earned my living, I kept up my pants by providing advice and being arbitrary. Not my judges have uh, kept their own pants because there are people that are appointed by the state. And so it just makes sense fully if you have business risk, you bring that to the plate or the desk of a judge. Not the first uh, port of call where you would go to if you had business problems. Now, if there's a change to the, sorry, to the, super, to the supervision of the rescue of business, you're often less involved as a court in appointing an RP. Because if there is a big business problem, and there are, let's say, 28 creditors, including four banks, and you bring them all together, and they come out after four hours with a solution, why should you involve yourself as a court with the solution that everyone agreed on? Even when there is no party passu or not every creditor got the same, etc. Everyone is satisfied. So, us, uh, of, often involved in the appointment of an IP, deciding only deciding on the objections of parties, Simit more similarity to company law procedures, like for instance the English uh, scheme of rating, and only the judge is asked in stages. You know, we have 28 uh, creditors here. Two creditors are the naysayers. I want my money. They are holding out. Oh, okay, fine. Let's go. <coughs> and now let's ask for this. Not all the all the other nitty gritty. Don't bring that to a court. So the integrity. You see the role of courts continues. Our recommendations. We have 115 recommendations. Let's start with recommendation one. <laughs> Courts handle big restructuring and solvency cases. It's important that there are independents because I was uh, speaking to a Polish uh, colleague and she said, well, you know, when we had our little ice cream during the lunch. Uh, I think it's most important what the creditors collect at the end of the day. I think it's most important, I said to you, can we test whether they trust the whole machinery, the whole system, isn't that much more important than the one cent more on the dollar that I receive? I think trust in the system in the long run in the insolvency is much more important than the crappy statistics that we learn that there were 8% or 10% or for the ordinary creditors. So now on qualifications. I've read much literature on you know Insolvency practitioner must be this and that, mm, very close to God. Then you can be <laughs> an insolvency practitioner. Well, I said to Stefan Madaus, let's have those rules applied to judges. He said to me, you cannot do that. <laughs> and I said, of course I can, because this is an academic world. We want to have some discussion. So a judge has to fulfill five criteria. A general understanding of business management. Also to understand that if you take a decision, it interferes with managerial or business strategic decisions which are typically made by investors. So it's very good to understand where the, where the, where the, where the difference is. Understand what it needs to effectively enforce rights, secured and unsecured. I have no doubt any uh, judge will know because it follows from generally from the civil or commercial legal system of a country. Preferably be a specialist in commercial matters. Be impartial and independent. This is written for the Eastern European countries. <laughs> because we got some signals from those countries that um, they could. Uh, be assisted by certain requirements on uh, independency and have the possible insolvency equities. So specialized courts and chambers should handle 
those uh, cases, as uh, Gijs van Dijk, this morning said, you can have, you know, commercial chambers or civil law chambers, but internally, many times you see a division in courts, the larger courts, and, you know, you de deal with trade and, and insolvency cases, or you deal with IP cases, and I, I think that should be, uh, should be encouraged. I, um, <coughs> sorry. My uh, successor in uh, Leiden is mm -hmm. Reinoud of Friesendorp, and he wrote a blog. We want judges with international commercial solvency practice. We want qualified judges to continue learning. It was mentioned several times. Uh, so independent countries note that it is necessary, and we saw it also in our uh, comparative story. And be careful with uh, rotation. Um, I'm not the youngest, as you understand, um, and I uh, was involved just for a little bit in, uh, I have to say, the Dutch uh, word of an airline, F-O-K-K-E-R, it's called Fokker Airlines, it's a name. Um, but I know that the, the liquidator dealing with that national airline, he said, this is the fourth supervisory judge I am meeting now in this court, and I have to explain the whole case to her. You know, 20 years ago, she suddenly she doesn't understand. You know how to finance uh, finance uh, airplanes. That national airline is still in liquidation 25 years later because they have a department that has lease contracts with Africa and South America. And Arnold Leufting, who is two meter four, every time goes to Gambia or Peru. Hi, my name is Arnold. Shall we continue our uh, contracts? And they want, and there's still money coming into. So why should you stop? So the indication is coming from the one of the reports, I think the Dutch report, like 11 years is, you know, it's rather long, but there may be reasons to continue the business within this formal uh, proceedings. Okay, okay. Um, the actors in the structure here themselves. The old, um, you know, dance of a lady and a man that's over. In, in, uh, you have courts and mediators and experts and supervisors on the one hand, IPs, dairy possessions, uh, turnaround managers, CROs, you, you've got them all. And now we go back to uh, this age word in 2011. So I said to Ian Fletcher, who passed away eight weeks ago, let's write a report on harmonization of insults of the report to 2012. And this is some sort of the ultimate aim. The governance system in an individual case, including the allocation of function between courts and liquidators, in the legal operation relationship between them based on law and additional many times practice regulations as well as the country's institutional system merely related to the requirements to fulfill these actors functions including professional and ethical rules to apply to them. And that has been Paul Omer recognizes roughly the same as in the court report of 18, eight, uh, 1987 the basis for what now is seen as one of the best of professional English systems we try to include here for on a European level. So what's the way ahead? Some sort of greater efforts in training of national and other union judges. Fine. Um, it's not necessary to say, you know, let's go to the government and ask for money. That's the official reaction, and then ten, ten past four, they go home. Now the reaction is the same as in, as in business. Gee, blockchain is coming into our practice, or whatever chain is coming to our practice. How do we deal with it? Okay, we better start to study, and let's prepare a, a memo and discuss it next uh, day in the evening, try to understand what it is. The Amsterdam court has developed 
on its own initiative, a professional insolvency standard to discuss with colleagues whether they meet that standard. Probably that uh, is an answer for you know the rather open and direct way the Dutch say, you know, you do it lousy. That's not what you say in other countries. But after five minutes in the lunch, you say, well, you, know, well, you can do better. <laughs> okay, let's try to see what we can do better. Now, in London, there's a financial list. Uh, the judge is uh, since. Uh, He's now a Sir, Sir William Blair, which is a special part of the, uh, in the High Court in commercial affairs that only deals with uncertain matters in the financial market, especially derivative contracts. And you can go to the court and ask the court, we don't have a conflict, so we cannot bring a case to the court with zillions of papers. No, but, but we have this issue can you provide some sort of first initial thoughts on what the view of a court would be if you would bring a case to the court? Now you have a judge who says, no, 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 I'm a judge. So start fighting and then come to me. And you have judges who say, hmm, you know, makes sense. Uh, so that's a, that's a possibility. The other possibility is uh, whatever, what? Macron, which is already two or three years old. But I remember there were you know, some, some from France here, there were 85 district courts, and now they're after some fights between <laughs> Bordeaux and Nantes and other cities that wanted to have their court, and now they're 19. And in the, even in the Netherlands, you know how large Netherlands is? <laughs> so if you spit, you're in, in Germany. So it's about 100 kilometers and 200 kilometers. We had 19 courts, district courts. Professor, did you say 19? I said 19, one, nine. Okay, now there are 11. And even in my city, the judges came to me. Well, you're a professor, and uh, now we live in Dordrecht, beautiful city. And we want to maintain our own court. I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> because we like to cycle to our court instead of going in the train to the Rotterdam court is only 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, system. Yeah. If you can challenge someone that is dealing with a case, why can't I challenge the judge that is on the case? <gasps> because judges in the public legal system, as I said, IPs are close to God with judges. <laughs> you know, our untouch ideas are untouchable. <laughs> not in business problems. If I think that you are not the best man, I can, uh, why can't I ask for another one? And don't hold it against me next year when I bring a normal case. Is this so? Is this so? Uh, provocative? It has been suggested by the Nordic Baltic insolvency group. Seven countries in the Nordic, including the three Baltic countries, they brought together a group of academics, practitioners, judges, etc., and brought the recommendations last year, and one of the recommendations was this. <coughs> Why, if you are a, a judge, and there's, you know, there's a whatever difficult problem coming to you, and it is a business problem. And you are paid by the government. And none of the people that are addressing you are paid by the government. And they tell you the problem. The answer could be, thank you for telling me, but it is your problem. I am not going to solve this, you know, this for you. I can appoint a mediator. And he will report back to me in two months you are going to pay the mediator. I'm sure in business, parties, law firms in London, etc., they will accept it because the court says so. Uh, why not create specific courts? If there's a lot of trade, for instance, between Spanish and Spain and Portugal, they've got war issues, 
why not a combined court with Spanish judges? Yes. <laughs> with Portuguese ones? Yes. Why not you stay in this? You call it tunnel vision for IPs? We've got tunnel visions for Porsche. We've done this like this for 40 years. Okay, the world is changing. Wake up. Yes. Do I have one minute? Uh, <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, the recommendation of March said we should promote uh, mediation. Next slide, please. The Nordic Baltic recommendation also said give us possibilities to appoint a mediator or a supervisor. Next one. There's mediation since uh, 08, but for cross-border uh, matters. But World Bank and Unstral said we should have mediation. And there is mediation presently, as I know, <coughs> in Belgium, uh, some in España, some in France, some in Greece, Portugal, although I read that it is not real mediation. <laughs> Okay, it's called mediation. So it's a horse. Uh, you call it a horse, but it is not the horse. Okay. And it is encouraged in the country. So you see a very reluctant <coughs> development there. The way ahead, trust. Next slide, please. One of the principles uh, I developed in another project, which is now in Article 42 one of the insolvency regulation is not a mediator but a trusted advisor. Why don't you appoint an intermediary because you have this case between Portugal, Holland and Bulgaria, you know, <coughs> language, oh, all systems. So an intermediary, he must have the qualifications, should be able to perform his duties impartially, accountable to the court that appoints him or her, compensated by the parties. So judges should be more open to the idea that they don't have to decide on everything, um, that mediators have uh, you know, their own problems, and in some cases appoint an independent intermediary. This is yes. <laughs> I've been laying in the sun there, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs>